Well, you're good. Awesome. Well, welcome. It's nice to see a, a new crowd for the afternoon. Uh, my name is Janine Bedros, and I'm here um, thanks to the kindness of a few organisations. So obviously Wood Fortier Inc. Um, and Bush Time and Sandra for having me part of the program. But I also want to give some um, uh, thank you to Ecolaboration who are a not-for-profit group based in Nambour. And I used to work for them and I used to do these sorts of talks and workshops with them. And so now I'm a volunteer for that organisation because I'm very passionate about what they do. Um, so they've loaned me some equipment and resources, which is great. Um, and I'm also here representing the Australian Citizen Science Association. So if you're enjoying the talks in this venue and uh, some of the walks where you get to look at, um, go look for and record wildlife, I really suggest that you look them up because they've got a wonderful tool on their website called Project Finder. You can go in there, and whatever topic you're interested in, and you put your location in there and you can find more projects um, near you that you can get involved in. So a little uh, plug for those two organisations. So I'm here to talk to you about water bugs. So what are water bugs? Well, in the scientific community, we actually refer to them as aquatic macroinvertebrates. So aquatic meaning that they spend part of their life cycle in water. Macro meaning that although they're small, you can still see them with your naked eye. You don't need a microscope to be able to see them. And invertebrate, meaning that they don't have a backbone. So a lot of the things that we're talking about are things like snails and yabbies and um, the things that you often see flying near water, like dragonflies and mayflies um, and even midges and beetles and things like that. So those are the sorts of things that we're talking about when, when we're looking at water bugs. So remembering the invertebrate no backbone part, that means we're not looking at fish and we're not looking at frogs or tadpoles either. Okay, very important to remember that. <laughs> what sort of things do you, are we looking at? Do, does anyone know what these are? Okay, so the yeah, that's right. So mis mosquito larvae are part of um, water bug group. We're all familiar with what they look like as adults. Mummy and daddy. Anyone know what that is? A tick? A tick? Any other guesses? No? Dragonfly. So a lot of water bugs as young don't really resemble the adults very much. They're, they're something entirely different when they're in the water, very different to what we see flying around. So we, I mean, I, I know personally before I started looking closer into water bugs, I used to always think of dragonflies as terrestrial. They fly around, they're on land. But actually, they spend most of their life in water, and it's only a very short period of time that we're seeing them in the adult form. So it's it's good to keep that in mind because if you want if you want to see more dragonflies around, if there's something that you love, well then you need to consider um, your local creek and waterway, and is the water quality good enough? to support their young for the amount of time they need to become adults. And some of these life cycles are amazing. So maybe um, there's some, like mayflies in particular, um, they might live as adults maybe for two days, just enough time to mate, lay eggs in the water. It might take them two years to get to the stage where they're ready to become adults. So they're, they're not terrestrial, really. They're, they're quite aquatic. Nobody knows what I do they? <laughs> I like it. It's, it's green. So closely related to the dragonfly, damselflies. Do you know a very easy way to tell the difference between dragonflies and damselflies as well? Do you know? Yeah, good job. So, so their wings. So as adults, dragonflies tend to, most of them, sit with their wings out. Whereas damselflies tend to hold them along their body. A nice easy way to tell them apart, most of them. Oh, okay, so a really beautiful one here. Um, I'm not sure if you, you are going to be familiar with this. I, I was actually lucky enough that one came and landed on me while I was eating lunch today. Mayflies. So beautiful and delicate, both in the adult form and um, as young as well. Um, so 
So sometimes they're very easily mistaken the, the larvae with damselflies because they both have three tails, but you'll notice that the damselfly has a very long, skinny body, whereas the mayfly tends to have a bit of a stockier body, and mayflies tend to have their gills also along their, along their abdomen, which, which the damselfly don't. So these are things that with time, the more that you look at um, water bugs start to stand out to you and help you to tell them apart. Anyone want to have a guess what that is? Yeah? What was that? A bloodworm. It is called a bloodworm. Do you know what um, it turns into once it's an adult? Yeah? A leech. So leeches actually look very similar through most of their um, life cycle. This is not a leech. It's actually a midge. This is a non-biting midge. Um, so flies... Um, or things that um, resemble flies tend to look like worms when they're young. It's a bit confusing, but there's so many things where I look at it and I think, what sort of worm are you? It turns out it's a Dobson fly or a crane fly or a something fly. So it's it's quite incredible, like I was saying, that the difference in between how they look when they're young compared to adults. So um, the really cool thing, the, the reason why these are called blood worms is obviously they're so bright red, looks like the colour of um, blood, but they actually have um, they actually have haemoglobin in them, or, or yeah, but it is, it's a haemoglobin. They, um, the non-biting midge tend to live um, in the sediments right at the bottom, often of um, slow-flowing uh, waterways and things like that. So they'll be at the bottom of the pool, right in the sediment where there's not very much oxygen. So to adapt to those sorts of conditions, they still need oxygen to live. They actually have quite a lot of hemoglobin in them, which means that they're able to convert what little oxygen there is into, into something that their body can use, and that's why they're, they're bright red. So this life cycle um, of insects, how do they go from... You know, how, how they transform the, something that looks like that to like that. I often like to relate it to butterflies. And I know butterflies are not a water bug, but most people are familiar with the life cycle of water bug, which is, oh, sorry, of a butterfly, which is why I like to start here. So um, uh, a butterfly, the adult female, will lay eggs. The eggs hatch, and you have a caterpillar, which we call the larva. Caterpillar will eat, and it's, it's one job is to not get eaten and to eat a lot, <laughs> so to grow. And when it finally gets to the right size or the right stage, um, it will um, it will um, it build a cocoon or form a chrysalis, however you like to word it. And it, at that stage, we call it a pupa. It's in the pupal stage. It's not eating. It's not moving. It's pretty much hibernating while its body undergoes a massive transformation. And when it's ready, it will then emerge from its cocoon as an adult butterfly. So a lot of water bugs or a lot of insects will have a very similar cycle, and we call that this, this whole process a metamorphosis. So mosquito, for example, is very simple, very similar life cycle to butterflies. So the adult female, she lays eggs. She lays them on the surface of the water, and there they float until they hatch. And then out comes a larva, which is very similar to a, a caterpillar of a butterfly. Its job is to eat and to grow and to not get eaten. And then when it's ready, it will form its own version of a pupil stage. It, um, but, um, a butterfly's caterpillar will completely cocoon itself while it goes through that, um, while it's in that pupil stage, whereas a, um, a mosquito pupa will just do it over its head. I don't know if you've ever seen, what do they call them? I think they call it an ostrich pillow. So they're shaped like a big new egg. And um, they, you know, when you sleep on planes and things like that, they sell them and you can put them over your head and then you pull your head to the side. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's what I think of whenever I see this. Um, so, th so you kind of just see them, they have their little tail hanging out and that's so they can move around. Um, but other than that, they're pretty much not, they're, they're hibernating until they're ready to turn into an adult. So that's a mosquito's life cycle. Some... 
um, insects have a um, slightly different process that they go through. So it's still a metamorphosis, but they call it a partial metamorphosis. And the reason for that is taking a, a dragonfly as an example, is the dragonfly female adult, she will lay eggs. Dragonflies will lay them in water, not on water. The eggs hatch. What comes out, we don't call it a larva, we call it a nymph. And the reason for that is because the dragonfly, the, the, the nymph, it never forms a cocoon, it never goes into that pupal stage. It basically grows, it molts, it sheds its, its outer skin every time it gets bigger. And then finally, when it's ready, it will crawl out of the water and it will transform into an adult dragonfly. So because it skips that stage, we call it a, the stage of being a pupa. Um, we call it a nymph, and it's a partial metamorphosis. But it's all a very similar type of life cycle. And I was so lucky. I've been, I'm not an expert in water bugs. I'm more of a water bug enthusiast. Um, and I've been um, going out and sampling them and looking at them for about eight or nine years. And for the first time, it was here last year, I was actually looking for frogs um, at the pond near the duck and I was sitting there and I was looking at the frogs and I was looking at the funny snails swimming in the water and then right in front of me, right there was a, um, a dragonfly emerging. So you can see, well this work, that doesn't work, but you can see here, that's the exoskeleton it just came out of. So it's crawled up out of the water and it's split from the back and out it's come. So they do this at night so that they don't get eaten. I've actually got a video of this happening here. It's amazing. So this is a video of someone who they've had a dragonfly. I, I don't know what the story is of where it's come from, but it's, it's not an Australian species. This is from overseas. And so the, the, the nymph has gotten to the stage where it's ready to emerge. So it's, it's exoskeleton, it's outer skin has split from the back and out it comes. So it comes out, pops out like an accordion. So it was all squashed up, its abdomen was all squashed up in that tiny little body before and now it's, it's popped out. So this process, I mean this video goes for about a minute, but the actual process is you know, overnight, several hours. And what's happening is that there's actually like a, a fluid that goes through the dragonfly's body. So when it breathes in oxygen, it comes out of the water, it breathes in oxygen that triggers this process of this fluid um, flowing through the body. And that fluid is it's like a hydraulic fluid. It's making everything bigger. It's pushing everything out. Um, and next you can see the wings. See how they're all, they were all curled up, curled up, curled up before. And then slowly, slowly, as this fluid is being pumped through, and they're about to fast forward it now. That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. So they do this overnight, like I said, so that they don't get eaten. And also it's timed so that just as the winds are at the, the maximum size, the sun is coming up, and then the sun hardens their body into shape. But they don't want to start too late into the night, otherwise they're sitting there victim to being eaten because they can't really do anything through this process. They have to wait until their, their body is ready. And then you'll see, if you click on the bottom there, you'll actually see the excess, whoop, uh, the excess liquid drain out. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. So, I was I just felt really lucky to see that um, when I did. It's very important if you ever come across this that you don't interfere with the process, otherwise you could end up um, causing the wings or the body to be deformed. So just let them do their thing. There you go. Pretty amazing. Right. So, um, so, so where do these things live? Obviously in water, fresh water, they don't really like, some of them can live in salty conditions, but the majority of them don't. They want to be living in fresh water. And they're found everywhere. So if you look in a creek, it's not just water in the creek. There's rocks, there's holes, there's gaps in between things. There's fallen logs where the water has caused a gap underneath. Um, there's overhanging vegetation and, and things 
coming up from underneath. All of these things are different types of habitats for different types of water bugs. So um, different water bugs have their own preferences about where they want to live. So some of them, like the blood bugs, will be in the sediment at the bottom. Some of them will actually be on the surface. And I'll, I'll show you um, some pictures in a video soon of, of something that I think you'll recognise that lives on the surface. Some of them are swimming about, but the majority of them are actually on those edges um, or wherever there's rocks and snags and bricks and things like that. That's actually their preferred habitat. So that's really important. When we go out sampling, when we go out looking for them, that we have to go and we have to run our net over all those different habitats to make sure that we're actually finding everything that's possibly there. So when we go sampling, when we go looking for bugs, we focus on three main areas. So we've got the riffle, not ripple, riffle. Uh, so the riffle is where a creek gets a little shallower. Often there's rocks or, or logs or something there that's causing um, the water to break. And that's actually where you'll find the, um, the biggest diversity of water bugs. They, a lot of them really like living there. In comparison, some of them don't like living in the riffle. If there's too much flow, there's too many things coming at them, too stressful, they're not very good swimmers, for whatever reason. Some of them actually prefer calmer waters, and so you'll find them more in the pools. So wherever the creek gets wider, um, the water tends to slow down, and that's where you might find some of those slower swimmers. Um, and then you have the edges. So you'll also find a lot of variety in the edges. So. Like I said before, you know, there's just, there's just so much, I don't know what you call it, texture or possibility in the edges. It's the roots, it's the banks, the rocks, the everything. Um, if you are a bug that doesn't like it when the water flows too, too fast, you might hang around the edges because you can hold on to things or you can um, shelter behind things. Um, if you're a predator and you eat other insects, you might like hanging around the edges because things that can't swim might fall off the vegetation fall in the water and, and there's a, an easy meal. So those are the popular places or those are the places that we tend to sample. And it's really important as well, it's not just those three locations, we also need to consider all the different types of aquatic plants as well. So you can have the emergent plants, things like sedges where they're rooted in the ground and then they come out of the water. There'll be lots of things living um, within those matted roots, I guess. Um, even things that are just floating around, just algae, just floating around will have things in there. Um, or there'll be things like lily pads where they've got a root in the ground but then the actual plant is up high. All those, all those different varieties are, are things that we should be sampling and, and checking as well. So, like I said, different water bugs like to live in different places and there's reasons for that. So they've, often it's because they, they, they choose or they prefer to hang out in places that um, where they can succeed the most. So they've got adaptations to where um, to the to the part of the waterway that they live in, or they choose the waterway the part of the waterway that best suits them so that they can thrive. So I'll show you some um, some videos and pictures of the uh, different adaptations of water bugs, and will help explain why you find them in certain places and not others. So this is the diving beetle. So a diving beetle, even though a lot of um, the water bugs, obviously they're aquatic, they spend a lot of time in water, they don't all breathe oxygen out of the water. Quite a lot of them actually breathe oxygen out of the atmosphere, so they need to come to the surface for that. So a diving beetle is one of those. Let's play this video. This beetle traps the bubble with his outer wings. Then he holds it under the surface while it comes to food. See how the bubble is attached to its rump? That's where his breathing holes are. When he's used up the oxygen in the bubble, he lets it go and returns to the surface. Oh, cool, hey. Could you hear that okay? Yeah? Oh, oh, okay. So basically what that video was telling you about, have you ever played Sonic the Hedgehog? If you, if you ever played that video game, is it still popular or is that really old? Well, basically, <laughs> I remember when I used to play Sonic and then Sonic would go under the water and he'd get a breathing bu bubble over his head. <laughs> or, um, or like just a scuba diver. Basically, because the beetle has to breathe um, air, 
yeah, it needs to breathe air. Basically, that's where it gets its oxygen from. So what it does, instead of having to come to the surface all the time, that's a waste of energy and it's also at risk of getting eaten up at the surface. So it wants to lengthen the amount of time it can spend underwater. So it's actually, it's, its body is able to actually, I, just, I can't get over it, but it can hold an air bubble close to its body and when it needs it, it will breathe the air out of that out of that bubble and a lot of insects so unlike us our where we breathe in from is close to our mouth it's not quite the same for a lot of insects they have the ability to breathe down at their rear end so that's why it actually holds the bubble down at its tail that's actually where it breathes from so mosquito larvae are actually quite similar in that they also breathe ox um, breathe oxygen out of the air so this actually explains a lot about them. So, so here's the, one of the larvae, um, larvae there, and they hang upside down. They remind me of fruit bats um, or flying foxes in that they, they spend most of their life hanging upside down. And that's because they actually have a breathing tube, or you can think of it like a snorkel. It comes out of their rear end <laughs> and uh, pokes up into the air. And so that's how they breathe. So that's why you see them hanging around the surface. And that's why you mostly find them in puddles and still water. So you're very unlikely to find them in creeks because when the water's flowing too fast, it constantly pushes them under and they have a hard time getting enough air to breathe. So that's one of the reasons why you always find them in puddles. Um, but also, they... The, the mosquito, the females, will lay deliberately in puddles, in in your gutters, in like in the base of your pot plants, even because there's no competition there. So, so because they don't need oxygen out of the water, they don't care that the water is not clean, and because they eat algae that's found almost anywhere that's got a bit of water on it. So they can thrive under those conditions and they also have a very quick breeding cycle. So from egg to adult can be as fast as one week or two weeks. So under the right conditions, a puddle would be perfect. No fish there to eat you, plenty of algae and puddle might be there for two weeks depending on how big it is. So, you know, pretty, pretty good adaptations. And, and as annoying as mosquitoes are, in terms of an ecosystem, in terms of the food chain, it is a good thing that they're very good breeders because often they, you know, particularly in bad years, um, they become a very important food source for a lot of because they're so successful and they're so good for them. So, you know, there is a positive to them, even though they're frustrating for us. It's almost on the opposite end of, of mosquito are mayflies. Mayflies are actually very, very sensitive to the pollution. And the reason for that is they have their, their gills along their abdomen. And a lot of um, ecologists compare this to like you having your lungs on the outside of your body. So you can imagine if, you, if you, your lungs are on the outside, there's nothing to protect them. You wouldn't survive very well in a populated, sorry, in a polluted city. You'd want the air to be very clean. And it's the same for mayflies, that they need the water to be very, very clean. Um, they actually need the water to be flowing over there, um, past their gills to be able to absorb the oxygen out of it. So you'll often find them in flowing water as well. Um, and some of the mayflies have adapted to be able to live in still water by actually fluttering their gills, which um, I think I do have a video of that. It'd be absolutely beautiful um, to watch. It looks like fluttering feathers or something like that. So their, their body is also, um, because they need water to flow past them to be able to absorb oxygen, often the water's flowing um, quite fast, so they need to be good swimmers. So their body is streamlined so that they can move through the water well. Um, and also, they tend to have really um, strong claws on their on their feet or on their legs, and so that's like held onto things. So remember, I was describing the riffle before, where there's rocks and the water's coming past really fast. So the 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 mayfly to stay in that area either will swim against the current or will hold onto rocks or um, dig into the sand so they don't you know, constantly get um, float away. So. So that's part of their adaptations for living in that sort of environment. The water boatman is also a very good swimmer, but it prefers um, still water. 
So, so because it doesn't have that flow of water to push it along, it's, it's got different adaptations. So its legs are actually shaped for swimming. They're more like an oar. So they get quite wide towards the end, and that's so that they could push more water with each stroke. But not only that, they have a lot of hairs on their leg. So every time they push, there's all these tiny little air bubbles getting stuck in, the, in their hairs, which is increasing the surface area of their leg. And it actually means that they can move quite fast in the water. And notice that they don't have any claws or anything like that because they don't need to grab onto things. Their skill is swimming. That's what they need because the water's not flowing where they live. Okay, so this is... I think this is really cool. I'm going to show you show you this video, and then I'm wondering if you know what this is. It's a person. Good job. <laughs> That's pretty cool. The louder he gets, the further out it is. Does anyone know what might be doing that? Water striders. So you've probably seen these often on the surface because they they quite they tend to live along the edges or in ponds and dams and things like that, and. They're responding to the, the sound waves of this man's voice because they're very, very sensitive to vibrations. Um, so the, the water striders also have lots of hairs on their legs and that's what makes them so sensitive to the vibrations. So they can't swim. Their survival technique is the ability to stay on top of the water. So they're very, very light and they spread their body out so that they distribute their weight so that they don't sink. And you can see the little dimples at each of their legs. So they're taking advantage of the, the surface, the, the te tension, the surface tension in the water so that they're not sinking. And then they, they actually that... Their, their jumping in response to that man's voice is actually part of their survival, their adaptation. The, the ripples caused by water strider jumping, it's, it's been given a name, it's called a ripple effect, and they do that because they're responding to a potential threat from something coming to eat them, they're responding to, oh, something's fallen in the water, can I go eat it, because they, they're predatory, um, or um, even their, their, their ability to jump and be quite strong jumpers is even part of their ability to be, um, particularly for the males, to be quite successful in mating. So uh, it's quite cool, um, and they yeah. I I used to say that their their ability to communicate through is um, similar to echolocation, but it was causing a lot of confusion because people were saying well, you have to send a signal out to be able to get a signal back. So it's not like echolocation at all, but they are able to read from the size of the ripples and the, the distance between them, um, potentially what's out there or how how. Um, how big it is, whatever's broken the water. Um, and even, you know, males will even use it to be territorial. Um, and, you know, they might say, I'm stronger than you. Look how big my ripples are. <laughs> Back off. You're not going to win a fight against me. So they're, they're pretty amazing. I'd actually love to do a whole presentation just on, on water striders because they're quite fascinating. Right. Um, this is another really cool one. So caddis flies. So today, just earlier this afternoon, we went out sampling and someone was having a look in the tray and they said, something's dragging dragging along a stick. And it, what, we, what it is, it's a caddis fly larva. So caddis fly, the, the larva, I wonder if you can see. Can you see these bands here? So they're what we call sclerotized. So that means that the they have a really hard shell. So the top of their head and sort of where their neck is, is protected because it's quite strong, but the rest of their body is really soft. So they're very vulnerable to being attacked. They're very vulnerable to things floating in the water and, and hitting them and hurting them. And so to respond to that, to protect themselves from that, they actually build their own home. They build a little case. And in our area, the ones I see the most are the stick caddis. So they actually bore out a hole in a stick and, um, to their size and they put themselves in there. And, and it, it's very, very difficult. I've never, 
as far as I understand, you, you can't get them out. They've got these really strong, you can't see, they've got very, very strong claws at the end of their body that they grip on it and they're not going to let go of that stick for anything. Um, but other, other types of caddisflies will build their homes out of other things. So some of them will use leaves, some of them will use um, uh, sand and gravel and, and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, there are some clever people out there, they actually breed them and they don't fill their tanks with um, gravel and sand, they fill it with jewellery. So, <laughs> so the, the caddis fly, um, the larvae will actually build their cases out of them, uh, like some gold and uh, gemstones and things like that and then, <laughs> and then they sell them as jewellery. <laughs> so they'll make them into earrings or um, necklaces or things like that. So. <laughs> I just find them fascinating. Um, but I mean, I prefer them in the natural state. But they will, they'll use anything as long as it's the right size and right texture for them. Ah, oh, okay. So dragonflies. I came across this quote and I love this. This is the best description. So, so Wired.com wrote an article on, on dragonflies and they describe the nymph as Predatory underwater dragons that breathe through their anus, use their rectum for jet propulsion, and have hydraulic powered grabby mouth parts. <laughs> and it's all very accurate. <laughs> so, so they are predators. Um, the, the dragonflies, um, as adults, they hunt, but even the nymphs in the water hunt as well. And so a lot of them will actually hide in the sediment underneath leaf litter and all the decaying matter. And rather than actually um, uh, chase their prey, a lot of them will just wait patiently. And have you ever watched the movie Predator? Where it opens its head mouth, that's a dragonfly's mouth. I'm pretty sure that's what they are inspired by. So their jaw, they have a very long jaw that sits under here. So this whole thing would be their jaw. And when something comes past just a little bit too close, they'll grab it. Imagine being a poor little bug, you know, something coming along. And <laughs> so they're pretty incredible and like I mentioned before um, a lot of insects um, breathe sort of through the lower part of their body um, I think dragonflies are a bit different they actually breathe in through their abdomen I believe they actually um, take the water in and absorb the oxygen out of it but they can actually they've got this ability to shoot shoot the water out and so if they need to get away really quickly or if they really want to chase something they can um, to shoot out of water out of their butts. It's great. Can we do that again? All right, so other than being weird and really fascinating, there's very important reasons why we're interested in water bugs and why we go out looking for them. So, first of all, they are at the bottom of the food chain. So, if you don't have water bugs, you're not going to have fish or crabs or. Um, or the things that eat the fish, you're not going to have birds, and then you're not going to have snakes, and you know, they're, they're, they're really important. So, you, you've got to have that first um, building block in the food chain, and that's what the water bugs are. So, so, we need to keep their waterways clean, but also, water bugs help to keep um, the water quality clear. So, a lot of them actually. Um, as shredders and eat decaying um, plant matter. So they're actually helping to remove buildup of nutrients out of the water. They're helping to um, remove particles out of the water. They're actually doing, they're playing a role in keeping the water clean and clear. Um, and the, the other reason why we sample, we monitor them is because they're what we call bioindicators. So that means that they're a living thing that can give us an idea of the of the health of the environment that they're living in. So different water bugs, like I mentioned, the mosquitoes will live in dirty water, doesn't bother them. All they need is algae and still water. Whereas the mayflies in comparison, they need the water to be flowing, they need lots of oxygen, they need it to be quite clean. So you can actually go out, you can take a sample have a look at the different species that are there. And then there's there's people who have actually assigned each species a score based on how sensitive it is to pollution. You can do a really quick calculation and it will tell you whether your waterway that you've had a look at is, is clean or not clean or not. 
um, you know, that sort of thing. And this is particularly useful when you go back to the same spot over and over again. So for example, we went today, this afternoon, we did a sample. It looks like that pond up there is not very healthy, but we've actually been up there before at different times and gotten a lot better, a much better result. Um, and I would say that the reason for our results today were probably because of the rain. Um, so when there's rain, the bugs sort of tend to just all go off and hide. They're not doing their normal thing. The water's a bit more murky. I'm probably a bit more hesitant to get in the dam because I don't know how deep it's gotten. So my sampling technique is not as good. Um, so it's why it's important to always come back and, and check again and again. Just quickly on, on some ways, I've said that they're really important. So how can we protect them? Um, some of the most important things that we can do is all around vegetation and vegetation along our creeks. So we're trying to prevent erosion. So all that sediment that goes into the water makes it dirtier, it reduces the oxygen, it makes it warmer. But not only that, I keep talking about how the water bugs like a variety of habitats. All that sediment that runs into our waterways, when it eventually settles, it has to settle on something. And what's happening is that in a lot of our waterways, um, all the little crevices in between the rocks and around the logs and all of the deep pools are all getting filled with sediment and they're getting shallower and shallower and there's less less of these crevices and holes and things like that for for aquatic life to live in so we need to reduce how much is running running off into our creeks um, the native vegetation helps with that helps hold the banks together but also i mentioned that you know there'll be some things that are eating the, the insects that live in the vegetation that accidentally fall in. There'll be things like the caddisfly that are relying on small twigs falling in so that they can shake them and form them into their hole, uh, into their home. Sorry. So um, it, it's it's important. It creates shade. Um, and we want to reduce. Basically, we just want to reduce pollutants running into our waterways in general. Um, insecticides and things like that can affect. You know, aquatic insects as well so so sometimes these chemicals do end up on our roads in our gardens and things like that and end up being washed into our creeks by accident and the build up of all of that a little bit here and a little bit there and it tends to build up and leaving snags alone so um, it's an old school thought that you have to clear logs and things like that out of creeks and rivers now it's understood how important they are for homes but also because of the variety that they create in the water flow so it'll slow it down or it'll speed it up in certain areas and again it's that variety that's so important for supporting supporting the, the aquatic life Okay, so how can we go out looking at them? You don't have to be a, a very qualified scientist to be looking at water bugs. Um, there's lots of opportunities for you to actually participate in this sort of activity. Um, so I mentioned that I'm here representing um, partly the Australian Citizen Science Association. You can jump onto their website and they have a really great tool, as I mentioned earlier, called the Project Finder. So you can jump on there and you can put in the topic that interests you. It might be water bugs, it might be, like, it might be health, it might be astronomy, and you can find a project in your area that, that interests you. Um, and so there are a lot of organisations that um, will do um, water bug sampling. Uh, definitely if you're in Brisbane, there's a few there and also on the Sunshine Coast. Um, but my two favourite apps for this activity, Sandra was talking earlier about, um, earlier this morning about iNaturalist, one of my favourite apps. Um, so you can just, if you go out there and you've sampled water bugs, you have no idea what they are take a clear photo, submit it through the app, or, you know, you, you could, if you, all you know is that it's an insect, all you know is that it's a snail, just sort of label it as that, put in the comments um, that it's aquatic, where you found it, and someone is bound to know what it is. Um, and it doesn't matter if the first person might not know what it is, but they might get you a step, step closer until eventually it comes across the eye of someone who's quite familiar with it and can identify it for you. And that's how you learn, and it's quite fun, um, I found. Um, or you can actually get really quite serious about this and use an app called the Waterbug 
clits. So that app is specifically designed for doing a calculation for the health of your waterway. So it's got in there some tools so you can identify the water bugs, and it's also got the scores in there. So you take a photo of what you found, you identify it. The app's actually quite helpful at helping you identify it. You say how many you found, and at the end it will, it will give you a number and say, this is how healthy your creek is. So like I said, come back and do it in the same spot again and again, and you start to learn a bit about what's going on. So what do you need? Um, I didn't bring my equipment with me, but that's okay because a lot of the photos show them. A net is, <laughs> is, is almost essential. The finer you can get the mesh on that net, the better. Some of these water bugs are so small, they're like, they're like the full stop at the end of a sentence. You know, the mites in particular are really little. So although you can, you don't have to go out and buy an expensive net. You can just go to your local pet shop and buy one of those nets for a fish tank and you will be able to catch plenty with that. But if you want to start getting a little bit more serious about it, you want to upgrade and get a, a, fire, a, a finer mesh net. Um, obviously, something to keep you dry and to protect your feet is a good idea, like gumboots or waders. Um, white trays, so white like these chairs, white, and that's to make the bugs stand out because they're so little, you need all the help that you can get. Um, some identification guides, so I mentioned the app, um, the Water Bug Blitz app, but there is so many, so many free online resources for identifying water bugs. It's a very popular activity all around the world, so it's, that's going to be the easiest thing for you to get your hands on. Um, and a freshwater stream, and it does not have to be a beautiful, pristine creek. I have done this in stormwater drains. So that's actually a stormwater drain in an industrial area that has a concrete base, and the sediments have built up so much that now there's grasses in there, and I've found a good variety in there. That's in another industrial area. It's not a concrete drain, but um, it's still a, like a, a natural tributary, I guess, where the rainwater is flowing through. Lots and lots of water bugs in there. A lake, pond. Um, so you're not going to find a lot in the middle. You're not going to find a lot swimming around in the water. But uh, in a space like this or um, up at the sedge pond um, where we sampled earlier today, you'd be sampling along the edges here in all this vegetation. So you don't even have to get your feet very wet at all. Beautiful. And yeah, I've even done it in the back of a shopping centre. Don't really recommend that. There's a lot of litter and broken glass, but still found them in there. So just fresh water is your main thing, not salty water. And, and also, I should say, looking for a variety of habitats. So people have asked if I've done sampling at the pond near the duck. I haven't really been keen because all on the edges there is mainly just grass. I can't really see a lot of potential habitat for a variety of water bugs in there. Compare that to the pond up at the what do you call it, at the deck um, near the Cooper's Bar up there. Um, that's got a lot, it's got a lot of sedges and a lot of things over the water and in the water as well. So that's been a much better place to sample. All right, so looking at the time, I'm going to skip some of these techniques because a lot of this information you can find online um, and there's a lot of groups out there, like I said. Um, I will just mention, so like I said before, um, just sampling along the edge like this, I've done quite successfully. Um, you just have to make sure you're actually collecting where the vegetation is like so if you've got reeds that are in the water make sure you're actually running your net against the plant itself so you're, you're pretty much like scraping up against it um, to be able to collect um, a good variety of bugs um, yeah and then spend some time getting to know them and do do remember to if you're going to have a go at this activity, please be very, very gentle with them. They're very little and they're very fragile and they rely on having strong feet and all the parts of their tail and their gills for survival in a very difficult world for them, a very competitive world. So please be very, very gentle with them. I actually try and adapt my sampling technique as much as possible that I empty the net into the tray and I actually try not to touch the bugs at all um, because if you let them settle, they will come out and find you rather than you digging through and crushing them. Um, keep them cool 
on a hot day, you do not want to do this in the sun. The shallow water that you've got them sitting in will get hot very quickly. So always think about doing this in the shade. Please always put the bugs back where you found them. They're so important. And like I said, you know, you might find a dragonfly or a little nymph and not think much of it. And that thing's probably been trying to grow for a year, you know. <laughs> so so just put it back and let it, let it live its life. Um, I do want to share with you, actually, I thought very quickly, um, we didn't have a hugely successful sampling session this afternoon, so I thought I've actually got some um, videos from earlier that I'll quickly go through and then see if anyone's got any questions. Is that working? No, it's not. I'm going to make that work there. Okay, so good. One, two, three. One, two, three. Good. All right. I need to duplicate, sorry. I need to duplicate my screen. Thanks so much for coming along. And, uh, yeah, I'm up here for some way tomorrow. This will be really good. Tonight, another one of the best. Uh, <laughs> day out. Mm -hmm. So, thanks again. So, how about What's now that we're really all done? What about what is that mouse going? About this speed? Yeah. So, three, four. There we go. Three, Got it on my screen. Five, Sorry. Thank four, you. Five. Try it like that. Yeah. Here we go. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you think that is? Mosquito. Remember the mosquitoes float near the surface? A larvae. It is. Oh, a lot of people think that's a leech, but it's not a leech. That's a black fly larva. So, um, I remember I said a lot of flies would tend to look like worms as young, and it does have like a, a suction at one end, which is how it's managing to move like that. But they're actually really cool. So they will live in fast flowing water, and they like to live in that water because lots of things flow. They're actually filter feeders. So as things um, flow past them, they'll take it in and they'll filter out the food um, out of the water. So they like sitting there because lots of things come past. And it, and it pushes the water through their, you know, their mouth parts. Um, but to stop themselves from floating away, they actually have a silk. So they produce a silk thread and they, they build like a little landing pad on the rock that they want to attach themselves to. And then they let themselves float out on a string. They do their eating when they want to go back. They just go back to their little landing pad, which is pretty cool. This is a flatworm, which I don't have much to say about. I'm going to throw the cube. <laughs> Do they? They look quite similar. Yeah. It's got a head like a spade. I find super cute. That is a good question. I think they must. I, I don't know. They look they look like they would, and that would explain why they're on the surface of things, if that's where their food is. They have vision. I don't know. The, the two little dots. They look like eyes, don't they? I'm not sure if they're actually eyes or if that's a defense thing to make them look like I'm looking at you. You know, you know, some some things do that. I'm sure about that either. So I didn't have much to say of them. It's cute. True my word. <laughs> Ah, uh, Yabby, so cute. So these are classified as water bugs and they can get quite big. Um, so you can tell them different to prawns or shrimps because these guys actually have claws. I can't remember what they eat. I think they eat decaying, decaying matter, if I'm remembering correctly. These are all the sorts of cute things you can see. <laughs> this one's really cool. This is a, a, a horsehair worm, or a, I think they call them a, a Gordian worm. Um, and there's a species of these. I don't know if they're found in Australia, but they're definitely in America. So this is, this is the, the adult, um, but the larvae are very, very small. And the larvae are particularly useless. They can't really do very much. They can't swim. So once they, they, they exist, they tend to just fall down to the bottom of the of the lake 
and they sit in the sediment and there they wait. They're not eating, they're waiting to be eaten. And so they get eaten by often other water bugs, um, which is not actually their main aim. Their main aim is so they then live inside the guts of the water bugs and then they wait until that is eventually eaten by specifically a cricket. So I'm only talking about one, one species of horse hair worm. So they wait until they're eaten by a cricket, which is actually the final destination that they try and get to. So then they live in the gut of the, of the cricket and there they get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually they're ready. So they live their lives basically just immersed in their food. Um, they absorb nutrients through their skin. They don't have mouth parts or anything like that. And then when they're ready to return to the water, crickets, which are usually quite um, water shy, they use like a, they emit like a, they actually, it's like, what do you call it? They turn the cricket into a zombie almost. So the, the crickets live their normal life until the horse hair worm wants to get out and then it emits, I think they call them neurotransmitters. It's some sort of chemical that makes, that controls the cricket's brain and they send the cricket off to jump in to the water and then out the worm comes. So thank you very much. I'll have my water bath now. And it continues this life cycle. Um, so that's an ice cube tray. So, I don't know, what's that, 20 centimetres? I don't know how big they get, but that one was pretty long. I don't know, but that would be interesting. Hey, I'm not sure how long the whole life cycle is. It's only one species of um, of that worm that I know does that. So, so that's the thing that always does my head in. So not all dragonflies eat the same thing and not all mayflies eat the same thing. And so you can have huge variations. Ah, oh, here we go. Remember I was telling you about the mayflies with their gills? It's so beautiful. Sorry, I'll, I'll get my uh, camera into focus in just a minute. Just love it. That should have been part of the Pink Martini show last night. That is a mayfly. So you know it's a mayfly because it has three long, thin tails. A damselfly would only have two. Um, and also damselflies do not have their gills on their, on their abdomen. So that's how pretty that they can look. The mayflies. Does that movement have any function? Or is yes. So they, they're the ones that need, um, they need water to flow past their gills in order to be able to absorb oxygen. So they've adapted to living in in non-flowing water by actually moving moving them. Yeah, not all mayflies can do that. So this one's kind of cool. Um, it's been nicknamed like an eyelash an eyelash that's swimming. It's called a pog, P-O-G, and that's actually the larva of a similar to a sandfly or a biting a biting midge. Yeah, so it literally looks like a, a an eyelash that swims. So you have to sometimes be quite alert to very little things that you might otherwise not notice. Um, and the last one, so this here is the most sensitive. So if you find this in your water, or if you find a lot of these in your water, you know you've got very a pristine quality. It's a stonefly. And um, I, I'm not sure what makes it so sensitive to pollution other than I know that they need a lot of oxygen. Um, that needs to be very oxygen rich waters for them to be able to breathe. Um, and it's been nicknamed a fluffle butt. <laughs> or off its reasons. Also should have been in the pink martini and cabaret show last night. <laughs> so yeah, there's some of the some of the creatures that you get to see um, when you go out having a look. Um, if you live in this area, one of the organisations that does these activities, Ecolaboration, as I said in Nambour, but there's so many catchment care groups. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today. If you know the name of, your, of the river that your local waterway flows into, that's often what your local catchment care group is named after. So it's very easy to be able to look them up um, and find them. Um, yeah, and I should mention as well, I actually, I used to work for Ecolaboration but I currently work for Sunshine Coast Council and one of the places where I work is up at Mary Cancross. And if you find um, invertebrates, if you've been going out for walks with Helen or um, anybody else and you've been finding insects really interesting, there's actually currently a display or an exhibition on invertebrates in the Discovery Centre at Mary Cancross at the moment, which is what, half an hour? Yeah. 
Does anybody have any questions? Diving beetle? I don't know. I'm going to guess that's the prowess of the the beetle. Um, I can't imagine that it would need. To, do you mean like how long it can hold its breath underwater for? Or? Yeah. Is it one breath? Oh, I would say it would be one breath. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, look, I'm trying to remember last time. I go into phases, like I'll start reading a lot about diving beetles and then I'll start reading a lot about water striders, right? <laughs> my new favourite animal. And I was at one stage reading about diving beetles. I, it could actually be that they're gradually using it rather than one big gasp. Yeah, I think, yeah. The size of the bubble? I, I would guess that's all part of their, like, part of their you know, survival of the fittest. So the ones that have the body that can form the biggest bubble that lasts the longest are the ones that are going to survive. And you know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't think there'd be an exact time for, for each one. I think it's just. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. That's true. Yes. Yeah. So obviously a depth of, they wouldn't be living in very, very deep places because of that distance. Yeah. They can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So they can relocate. So if their puddle um, or their their waterway that they're living in, if it's not always flowing and it dries out, they can relocate. And a lot, a lot of the adult water bugs can do that. Yeah. Any other? Yeah, the number of water beetles are crashing like other invertebrates. I couldn't give you a statistic, but I think that it's it's that they are known to be decreasing. When I used to do this a lot more often. I would find it was very seasonal. So normally you would go, normally the best time to go looking for water bugs is autumn and spring. That's when you find the biggest diversity. That's when they're a good size. So today we were finding really, really tiny boatmen and they were hard to see and identify. If we went in spring, they would be a lot easier to identify. So, um, so I have noticed that they are, uh, what was it, was it? Yazi, I don't know, it was probably about five years ago, there was an X cyclone that passed through the area and um, it was quite a big one. And I noticed that the populations dropped in all of our monitoring sites then, and it probably took them a couple of years to, to build up again. So they do respond to those sorts of events. I haven't looked into long-term trends, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're decreasing. Water quality is a big issue, habitat's a big issue. More questions or... all right thank you very much hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon